All right. Welcome to another episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm the author of Love Hope Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. And, and also the host, of course, of the Love Hope Lime podcast, which you're listening to. You could find the book on Amazon. Hey, just FYI, if you are a Lyme survivor, Heather, I've made the e-version of the book free for chronic Lyme survivors. All they need to do is reach out to me via Facebook or LinkedIn, or they can go to freddiamond.com or they can send me a fax. There you go. Thanks for holding up the book. And thanks for taking a couple of photos as well in various social media. So when I wrote the book, Heather, I met some amazing leaders like you in the, in the Lyme community, doctors, medical practitioners, uh, directors of charities and non-for-profits. And they've all helped me understand what living with Lyme is all about. So on this podcast, I invite them like you to share their insights into how you, hopefully people listening, family, friends, supporters, et cetera, can support someone that they love with chronic Lyme. And if you're a chronic Lyme survivor, hopefully on this podcast, it'll help you understand how you can let your family and friends support you, how you needed to be supported and or how you need to be supported. Hey, we transcribe every episode. You can find them on freddiamond.com and just click on the Love, Hope, Lime button. But I'm excited. We're interviewing today. We're talking with Heather Gray. She's known as the Lime Boss. And Heather, I've gotten to see uh, a lot of what you've been publishing and, and what, are you, what, what are what you're doing. You've been on a couple of other podcasts as well. You're a Lyme survivor, but you're giving back. Your business is helping Lyme survivors navigate through this world. And it's one thing I, I learned so much, of course, when I was doing the research for the book. But one thing I learned is it's so complicated. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah. So I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner who, like you said, overcame 28 years of undiagnosed Lyme disease, uh, mold toxicity, heavy metals, three autoimmune diseases, overweight, suicidal, depressed, mm -hmm. anxious, you know, all the things. And so I've, you know, been given this gift of my life back after, like I said, decades of being sick. And then, you know, another decade of education and peeling back different layers, because it seems like once I would get one layer peeled back and then something else would pop up and it was just this, this continuous, you know, learning cycle. And that's part of what, why I do what I do is because I've taken everything that I've learned all the mistakes of doing things out of order or, you know, focusing on treatment first before that the body is ready to actually go to war with these critters, you know, all the different steps and, and all the different pieces that need to be together, right. In order to heal and stay healed, because that was also the thing I was dealing with is that I would get better and then I would relapse and then I'd get better and then I'd relapse. And, you know, I found the reason why I was relapsing. And then now I've been two years, you know, no relapse, lost over 80 pounds. I'm no longer suicidal. I'm no longer in pain. I have a very successful business helping others with Lyme and mold and autoimmune diseases. Uh, that's a great way to describe it. And I've listened to you on a couple of podcasts and you've gone through your story uh, in depth and your entire story and, and how you've gone through various stages. And I just want to applaud you for, for giving back. I mean, obviously it's your business, but, um, but for giving back, because it's, it's such a complicated disease. And when I started to do research on it, I, one thing I kept seeing time and time again was uh, what's going to happen next, or if I do this, what's going to happen, or should I do this before I do this? And uh, there's tens of thousands of people up on the various Lyme support groups on Facebook and Reddit and Instagram and Twitter who are just looking for answers. So I'm excited uh, for what you do to provide them. Absolutely. So let's talk. Yep. Yeah, so let's talk about this. What are three things? Let's start off. Three things, family members, partners, and friends, what do they need to know about what their loved one is going through? Great questions. Hmm. So some of the biggest problems I had with my ex-husband when I was going through this is these very things. So being able to actually put this out there, like how, what a beautiful gift. Thank you. Um, but the first one would be, you know, if they're your loved one, right, you, you know them. And if you know that they're acting off and they're acting out and they're not being nice, that that's probably not them talking. That's probably something else talking. And so I, I used to tell my ex-husband, if I'm acting this way on the outside, can you imagine how I'm feeling on the inside? Because if you actually knew my heart, you knew I'm not this snarky, mean, nasty person that I would turn into from time to time. And so my new husband, 
he doesn't meet me with fire with fire like that's what my ex-husband did he meets me with grace right and then i was able to move through what it is that i needed to move through and then i'd apologize later because i had you know he kept his side of the street clean so the person left apologizing was myself so number one would be to like i said just try to have some empathy and some grace for when they're not on their best behavior and they they might be acting out right but it's usually because they feel like crap yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, one of the aspects, of course, of Lyme is the neuro side, and that it causes things like anxiety and stress and, and brain fog and things along those lines. And um, talk about that for a second. Was that something that was a, a preeminent uh, symptom when you were battling Lyme? Absolutely. One of the biggest and the one that I've dealt with the longest, you know, my first uh, psych ward, uh, you know, suicide attempt was back when I was 15 years old. And then I had another one when I was 19 and then probably could have gone a few more times as a, as an adult. And so, and that was the, the most frustrating part too, is because when your brain is inflamed, right? Brain on fire, however you want to say it, it, you really don't have control. You know, so first off, you're malnourished because your body's been you know, taken over by these parasites for so long. So your body's not getting what it needs to work properly. And then two, it's inflamed. Um, so it's like a double whammy against you and, and you you don't have any control. I used to tell my ex-husband it felt like an out-of-body experience where, you know, I would I would the Lyme rage. It's a real thing. And I'd get triggered and I could, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. Like I could watch myself out of myself going, Heather, what are you doing? Heather, knock it off. Heather, what are you doing? But in the, in the midst of it, there was no stopping me. And it used to piss me off because I'd work with psychologists and other practitioners and they're like, just count to 10. And I'm like, you don't understand. There is no 10 to count to. There is something happens and then there's me reacting. There was no freaking control over me not reacting until I got better, until I got the inflammation down, until I got my body working right, until I got the nutrition in my body that I needed to. And yeah, absolutely. There's a buffer. Now I can count to 10, but back then there was no counting to 10. There was pure reaction. I have a question for you. So one thing that, uh, one of the reasons why we're doing the podcast is I met so many people who are, I hate to just, just throw out giving back, but who who have made it um, their mission to support the Lyme community. And, uh, you know, there's people who've created not-for-profits and people like you who've created businesses to provide significant value to people going through it. Why is that with this particular disease? And what led you, Heather Gray, the Lyme boss, what led you to saying, this is going to be what I am now going to do for a living and I'm going to be devoting my career to? You know, it's funny because when I started my business back up, uh, almost three years ago, for the first year and a half, I wasn't dealing with Lyme. I was working with autoimmune and mental health and weight loss because, holy crap, have you ever met a person with Lyme? Like, it's complicated. It's complex. Um, it's expensive. It's heavy. It can be heavy, heavy work um, with some of the most difficult cases out there. And so I was, and people would ask me, Heather, wait, who knew my story? They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> why aren't you working with Lyme? And I was like, <laughs> no. And it was about a year and a half into my journey. And I shit you not, it was like a God smack. Like I woke up one morning and I was like, <gasps> and I was like, God telling me that he had given me this gift. Yeah. Right. And how can I not work with Lyme folks? How can I not be a beacon and help guide them to how I'm living today? Because if you would have told me 15 years ago that this life was possible, I would have told you you were full of, you know, you BS. Um, but yeah, so that's, it's a funny, so that's how I got actually doing into the Lyme. And then it was just like putting my toe in. And then about three months after that, that's when I just full on uh, rebranded. I got the nickname when I was working in Mindshare, which is a business community mm -hmm. uh, for alternative practitioners. And somebody in one of my classes started calling me boss, Lyme boss. And I was like, I kind of like it. So then we rebranded a couple months ago and here I am. Well, good for you. So you mentioned empathy before and how your, your husband is very empathetic to what you're going through. Uh, what is the single best way for the people listening out there, for the family and friends who are, who really don't know what to do? What is the single best way to support a chronic Lyme survivor? You know, everybody's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And the best way I think that you could do that without getting into too much trouble would be just to ask. Ask, hmm. how can I support you? What can I do for you today? Because even in the clients and that I talk to and myself, 
we often feel like burdens. Mm. Like that is one of the biggest things that we carry around with us. We feel like, a, especially a lot of type A personalities have a tendency to get taken down with this disease. And we're the last ones that want to have somebody, you know, help us do anything, right? I'm a very capable person. Um, and, and it was, it was tough. And then, so to ask, um, was even tougher and then to ask, and then sometimes not get help was, whew, that was just heartbreaking. And so just even, you know, Hey, what can I get you? What can I do for you today? How can I support you? And then just having the understanding and being flexible that every day is going to look a little different. So what, what might work and was supportive one day, this person might need something totally different another day. And just, just just being flexible and just being of support, like it, what a God sent, what a gift. Now that's such a great answer. You know, one thing that we all know, or those of us who are, uh, who are conversant online is that it affects so many different parts of the body. I've met so many people, some people who said they don't have any of the, of the neuro issues. They don't have the brain fog, but they have intense pain, fatigue, those kinds of things. And I met people who say that it's all about the neuro side. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, if someone, we use the example, if somebody breaks an ankle, okay, they're going to be on their butt for six weeks. And they're going to watch TV. You know how to support them. You bring them food, you cook them food type of a thing. With Lyme, there's just so many different ways. What shouldn't they be doing? What are some things that uh, people that you're supporting have said, I just wish my family wouldn't do this or my friends would just not do this anymore? You know, it would be great to learn and educate yourself. I think that was the biggest thing that pissed me off after my diagnosis and you know back then they only had one uh documentary out there and it was the under our skin mm -hmm. and it's really freaking heavy and intense and actually i don't really recommend it these days <laughs> i love the new ones that have come out like the monster inside me is freaking awesome and um the quiet what? epidemic yeah, yeah is awesome and so actually even even with the best intentions so like even my new husband and my stepson um did really well but they still weren't quite understanding. And one day I got a little pissed off and was like, I sat them both down in front of the TV and I had them watch the quiet epidemic and I left because I had already seen it. And then when I came back, they both had, you know, kind of tears in their eyes and they gave me big hugs and they were like, I am so sorry. And just, just having them understand because sometimes your, your loved ones can't hear it from, from you. Right. So sometimes helping getting, you know, outside information, like watching a documentary or listening to a podcast. Right. But just educating yourself to just try to understand a sliver of what they're going through, because this is such an isolating disease to begin with. And most of the time you feel like you're losing your mind. You're going crazy. You don't know what's going on. And then now and then you've got people in your life who can't even take two hours. Right. To educate themselves like I had put that out to all my family when I got diagnosed and only like one person took the time. It was my stepmother of all people. Yeah. My stepmother took the time to watch the documentary and go, wow, you know, how, and then it was, you know, how, how can I be of support? What, what can, what do you need? You know, type of thing. Cause it's like, otherwise, you know, like my mom thought that I was just attention seeking and a hypochondriac. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't that at all but I couldn't even get them to understand because they weren't even willing to like take, like I said, two hours and watch a documentary. Well, you know, part of it too, is that uh, there's a couple of things with Lyme. It, you can't, it's an invisible disease. So uh, you, if you're looking at somebody, uh, you can't, you can't tell, you know, okay, they're in bed, maybe they're tired. Uh, you don't understand the deep fatigue that a lot of Lyme survivors have told me that comes with the disease. What should they expect as their loved one's journey continues. You know, we talked about going into remission. We talked about, you mentioned this too. You said you can have a good day, then the next day things just explode, things flare, and something might be really bad today and tomorrow might be a different part of the body and you're constantly trying to figure out, you know, how do I solve these problems? Tell us what they should expect as they're gonna be paying more attention to what their loved one's going through. Lose all your expectations um, because this is just, you know, healing is not linear any way, shape or form, it's not linear. And so, like I said, dropping all your expectations and just going with the flow is, is probably going to be what's going to keep your sanity the most. Um, because it, 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 even in my own journey, like I said, healing, peeling back the layers, you know, and then something else pops up. It's like, okay, well now how do I deal with that? Or, and then this pops up. Okay. Well now how do I deal with that? You know, found out I had a bunch of teeth stuff and dental stuff that was keeping me from healing. And so I had to take care of that. And, you know, again, like patience, grace, <laughs> lose your expectations. Like it is the ultimate, 
surrender, yeah. right? <laughs> So I want to ask you one more question before I ask you for your final steps. You're an expert on nutrition and, uh, you know, that's, uh, you're, you're an FDN. What does that stand for again? Functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. So I take, I'm kind of like a hybrid between a functional doctor and a, and a functional coach. So I, I can take functional lab work and put together protocols, but then I do a lot of coaching around the lifestyle mindset, all the foundations that really need to be in place before you start going to war with your body. So give us some insights into the nutrition side of the disease. For example, uh, a lot of Lyme survivors are gluten-free and uh, frequently I see on the pod, on the, uh, the various uh, social media boards, should you drink alcohol? Yes, no, yes, no. Uh, you know, organic. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, removal of sugar, you know, uh, give a little bit of insight for a minute or so on the nutrition side of what people who support a Lyme survivor need to know. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I have found that folks with chronic illness also have certain issues in their DNA, you know, being able to detox properly, um, you know, food sensitivities, leaky gut. So there's, you know, why each one of us looks different. There's still a lot of similarities that go on in here. And so most folks that I work with, I put them on a paleo type diet, anti-inflammatory diet, um, right off the bat to just, it's kind of like low hanging fruit that and I'll do food sensitivity testing. So I'll do food sensitivity testing minus, you know, the, and, and, my, uh, and the paleo diet minus the food sensitivities just to kind of really dial in. And it's amazing when you can get some of that. So like if we have a leaky gut, right. And we're eating bananas every day, bananas get into our bloodstream that don't belong into our bloodstream causes an immune response and causes pain, causes inflammation. So now we found out that bananas is what you're reacting to. So we take those out and it can be just a few of those boulders that need to be taken off your nervous system, off your immune system for then your body just to go, ah, oh, okay, now I can breathe a little. And then, you know, it's amazing what starts coming back online. So it's just kind of like low hanging fruit, usually within the first couple of weeks of going paleo minus your food sensitivities. Like it's kind of amazing. I have one client who, you know, gave me a testimonial. She's like, it felt like a miracle. It was just like things just started coming back online and, and stuff stopped hurting and her gut started working properly. You know, not everyone has it that easy. Unfortunately, sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. But define, a, define leaky gut. That's something that we see frequently. Uh, define exactly what that means. Yeah. So leaky gut, we're supposed to have tight junctions, right, in our gut that really aren't supposed to allow a whole lot in and out. And through wheat, actually, grains are one of the biggest culprits for causing leaky gut because they're such a big protein and we're not um, properly processing them like our ancestors used to, right? So now they're acting like a battering ram on our gut. Um, uh, medications, stress, uh, metals, um, environmental toxins, all these things lead and will act like a battering ram and, and cause leaky gut. So now we've got stuff that only belongs in the gut getting into our bloodstream. And then, like I said, it's causing an immune response because our, our, our immune system's like, what the hell apples, you don't belong here. I don't recognize you tag. You're going to be a problem now. And so then anytime you eat apples after that, it automatically sends your immune system into red alert, red alert, red alert. Um, and sad with some of these other foods, like the wheat, wheat has a tendency to cross react with the thyroid because our mm. thyroid tissue actually looks a lot like a wheat molecule, believe it or not. Mm. So when a person eats wheat and their immune system gets tagged, now it's looking everywhere for wheat and it goes, oh, thyroid, you look like wheat and it starts tagging your thyroid. And that's why a lot of folks with chronic illness will end up getting, you know, stuff like uh, Hashimoto's and, yeah. and thyroid issues as well is because of this whole cross reaction thing. So that's why wheat is a huge one to to get out of the diet if you've got a chronic illness and you want to get better. Wow. You know, I really didn't know that tie into the thyroid. I knew that there was uh, definitely issues, but you just gave an answer to me. So I appreciate you for that. All right. Before I ask you for your final thought, again, we talked today with Heather Gray. She's the Lyme boss. And Heather, I just want to acknowledge you, you know, for the work that you're doing. You've helped hundreds of people. And I think you're going to wind up helping tens of thousands of people uh, once more people become aware of you and understand you and the, the service and the guidance and the counseling that you're providing people is, is enormous. It's, it's such a, like we mentioned before, there's so many complications, like you just alluded to an apple, you know, it's like, I have, I don't have Lyme disease as people, Lyme disease as people know. And I decided to write the book when I wanted to understand what someone in my life was going through. I have 
zero food tolerance issues. I could go upstairs and pretty much eat anything that I want to. And people with Lyme and other chronic illnesses, you have to be so careful in what you eat, sensitivity sometimes towards noise, towards lights, sometimes, you know, holding an, a phone, a smartphone, you know, the EMF can cause issues, if you will. So I just want to uh, applaud you for the work that you're doing and for the thousands of people that you're going to guide through so that they can, uh, you know, hopefully find peace. You know, people ask me, why'd you write this book? And I said, I just want to bring the community peace at the end of the day. It's a very, very troubled and challenged community. So good for you for the great work you're doing. And by the way, you communicate this so well. So I hope to see more from you. Yeah. Out there on, you know, go create some videos, some YouTube and stuff like that. Cause um, you, you speak to it in a very, uh, easy to grasp language, right? And a lot of times it's doctors and medical practitioners who, no disrespect, but who want to seem educated and smart or don't know that they're communicating above people's heads. So, you know, <laughs> you know well, let me make sure I say it the right way. You know so much and you sure. communicate it in a way that people can apply. All right. Once again, I want to thank Heather Gray, the Lime Boss. Heather, any final thoughts you'd like to make or tips you'd like to recommend to close down today's show? Absolutely. One of my favorite things to leave people with is no matter how common a symptom may be, it is never normal. Mm. It is always your body's check engine light coming on and saying, hey, there's a problem in here. But all too often we take a piece of tape, put it over that check engine light and keep rolling down the road. And then we're shocked when we've got multiple autoimmune diseases, we're overweight, we can't sleep at night, fill in the blank, right? So start listening to your body. It's got so much wisdom. Once again, my name is Fred Diamond. This is the Love Hope Podcast. I want to thank Heather Gray, the Lime Boss, for being our guest on today's show.